Hi, Chardon High School, we had shots fired, gun shots, multiple gun shots. Chardon High School, we need police up here. There's someone in the building with a gun. In the dark and wild landscape of the criminal justice system, there are criminals whose horrific acts still echo through time. School shooters who brutally murdered their friends, fellow students, and even teachers. What happens to these young criminals when they're caught and sent to prison? I have to live with this every day and it brings me nightmares and I can't live with myself sometimes. In this video, we will be exploring 10 school shooters and the dramatic changes their lives undergo behind bars. Nicolas Cruz. This mass murderer took the lives of 17 students at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida, the deadliest school shooting in U.S. history. He was subsequently found guilty and sentenced to life without parole. The story takes us to Valentine's Day in 2018, when the then 19-year-old Nicolas Cruz walked into the high school with deadly intentions. But how did Cruz become the bloodthirsty killer who shot up a school? To understand this story, we must go to the very beginning. Nicola Cruz was born on November 24, 1998, to Brenda Norma Woodward, a violent felon and drug addict. As soon as he was born, Cruz was placed in an orphanage, where he was found by his adoptive parents, Roger and Linda Cruz. However, the young boy had some notable behavioral issues and was eligible for special education prior to the deadly shooting. He was also diagnosed with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, or ADHD, as well as Oppositional Defiant Disorder, or ODD. Due to these conditions, Cruz was transferred between schools six times in three years, before finally landing at Stoneman Douglas High School. By 2017, the boy had been expelled from school due to disciplinary reasons, and according to the school administration, Cruz made some heavy threats, which he apparently planned to actualize. His social media posts were also quite disturbing, as he would often talk about guns and how he wanted to own one. It's worth noting that Cruz's mental health issues do not excuse his brutal and violent actions, and even he knew there would be no justification for the kind of bloodshed he was about to unleash. So on that day in 2018, Cruz walked into his former school armed with an M&P 15 Sport II semi-automatic rifle and a thirst for blood that couldn't be quenched. Without remorse, Cruz paraded the school, shooting anyone in sight. As the chaos spread and the innocent students waited for help, it seemed like ages before it came, and that's no thanks to the terrible handling of the situation by the police. By the time the smoke cleared on that day, 17 people were dead, including students and staff, and 17 others had varying degrees of injuries. After he stopped shooting, Cruz dropped his rifle on the top floor of the building and fled the scene by blending in with the fleeing students. He was subsequently arrested and charged with first-degree murder and attempted murder. Although he was able to dodge the death penalty, he will probably spend the rest of his life in prison. According to sources, Cruz has been placed in protective management in order to protect him from being harmed by those on the inside. This means he'll most likely spend his time alone in a 9 by 12 foot cell with a bed, a metal sink, and a metal toilet. For just one hour every day, Cruz will be allowed to stay in an outdoor cage, measuring 20 feet by 20 feet, where he can exercise and bounce a ball. He will eventually be placed in the general population, although that process may take years, and he will probably be transferred to another state to ensure anonymity. But if you think Cruz has it rough in prison, you should see how this next school shooter is treated behind bars. T.J. Lane This is Thomas Michael Lane, the 17-year-old kid responsible for the 2012 Chardon High School shooting. On the morning of February 27, 2012, Lane opened fire inside the school cafeteria, taking the lives of three students and wounding three others. When he walked into the building on that fateful day, his sight was set on a student he considered his romantic rival. But unfortunately, his murderous rampage claimed the lives of other innocent students. A look into Lane's life reveals an unhappy childhood. Lane's father, Thomas Michael Lane Jr., was in and out of prison, and it was all due to his history of violence against women, most especially Lane's mother, who was also arrested a couple of times for domestic violence. According to those who went to school with Lane, he was described as a reserved, 
kind and relatively normal teenage boy. However, some students recall seeing this dark and haunting look in his eyes sometimes. Just two months before the shooting, Lane left a disturbing post on his Facebook account, which read, I am death, and you have always been sod. Now feel death, not just mocking you, not just stalking you, but inside of you. Unfortunately, no one paid serious attention to the post, although most of his classmates later admitted that it freaked them out a little bit. The nightmare eventually unfolded around 7.20 a.m. on that fateful day. Lane stormed the cafeteria where many students were huddled together before class, and then he opened fire. He ultimately shot five male students and one female student before running out of the cafeteria where he got tackled by teacher and coach Joseph Rizzi and Frank Hall. He was quickly handed to the police and charged to court. His trial went as expected, and it didn't take long for the jury to reach a guilty verdict. However, before his sentence was handed down, Lane performed some wild shenanigans in court, like wearing a shirt with the word killer written on it, and making derogatory remarks to the family of the victims. Following his conviction, Lane was shipped off to the Allen Correctional Institution in Lima, Ohio. But that's not where his story ends. If you've ever wondered what happens to school shooters in prison, this is a good example. Within the confines of prison, Lane proved to be more than just a troubled kid from school, as he engaged in several acts of violence towards both officers and fellow inmates. Because of this, reports say he has been discovered at least seven times for behaviors ranging from self-mutilation to urinating on walls and refusing to perform assigned tasks. Then on September 11, 2014, Lane hatched a plan to escape from the prison alongside two other inmates. The plan was quite daring, but their freedom didn't last very long. As soon as news of his escape hit the airwaves, Chardon High School instantly closed its doors out of concern for the kid's safety. Thankfully, Lane and the other inmates were caught within just 24 hours and normalcy was restored to the society. He's currently serving the rest of his sentence at the Warren Correctional Institution in Youngstown, Ohio, a supermax prison where his privileges have been reduced to the bare minimum and his affinity for chaos has finally been curtailed. The wound he left on the community and America as a whole remains unhealed, but thankfully justice was well served, and Lane will never see the outside of a prison wall for the rest of his life. Jesse Osborne On November 13, 2019, 14-year-old Jesse Osborne was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole for his horrific crimes committed three years earlier. September 28, 2016 in Townville, South Carolina. Jesse Osborne walked into Townville Elementary School with murder on his mind. And by the time he was done with his evil plan, several innocent lives had been lost, including his own father. Prior to this tragic event, Osborne had also attended the same school and was known to be quite sociable and even did well in class. But then he got expelled in middle school for bringing in a hatchet and a machete to school months before the shooting. It is also believed that the young man was part of an online chat group obsessed with mass shootings, and some of the members encouraged Osborne to go on a bloody rampage. So he started planning, conducting searches on the internet, and for months he perfected his plan before the day of execution. He also acquired the weapon of choice, planned his entry and exit. So this was undoubtedly not a random outburst, but a premeditated well-planned attack. Around 1.45 p.m. on the day of the shooting, Osborne drove into the fence of Townville Elementary School in a black pickup truck. He was armed with a 40 caliber pistol, which he began firing into the air as soon as he got out. While repeatedly shouting, I hate my life, Osborne leapt over the wall and began firing at the students in the playground. It was a horrific scene straight out of a movie, but thankfully his gun jammed after shooting for just 12 seconds and he was eventually apprehended. During interrogation, Osborne revealed that he threw his gun and vest away after realizing that he was going to hell for what he'd done, so he called his grandparents to confess. Prior to shooting up the school, the young boy had also murdered his father in cold blood, and his body was eventually found sprawled up at the family home. Only one person lost their life during the shooting, which left three more injured. Although he was initially tried as a juvenile, Judge Edgar H. Long, who was in charge of the case, decided in February 2018 that the then 15-year-old would be tried as an adult. 
He was subsequently charged with two counts of murder, three counts of attempted murder, and five counts of possessing a weapon. On September 7, 2018, Osborne pled not guilty on all counts before a South Carolina Supreme Court judge. By by December of that year, the young boy had pled guilty to the five counts of murder and attempted murder and was handed his sentence in November 13, 2019. The case died down for a while until September 2023, when he appealed his sentence and got it changed to a 75-year term. He was initially incarcerated in the Kirkland Correctional Institution, but in January 2020, he was transferred to the Turboville Correctional Institution. And as of the making of this video, he's currently holed up in the Lieber Correctional Institution in Ridgeville, California. The reason for his constant transfers has been kept away from the public, but it's safe to assume that his time in prison isn't the dream life he's always wanted. Eric Christopher Houston On May 1, 1992, a 20-year-old gunman committed one of the deadliest school shootings in California, leading to the death of three students and one teacher. The perpetrator was a 20-year-old Eric Houston, a former student of Lyndhurst High School, who held a bitter grudge against the school because he failed to graduate. On the day before the attack, Houston placed a call to the principal, threatening to shoot up the pep rally that was planned for May 1st. In response to the threat, the principal called off the rally, but the bloody murderer still showed up anyway. Armed with a 12-gauge shotgun and a sawed-off 22 caliber rifle, Houston walked into the premises with bloodshot eyes. His main target was the Robert Brenz, his former civic teacher. Apparently, the man had failed him when he was still a student, which was one of the reasons he failed to graduate. Upon entering the building, he went straight for Brenz and delivered a fatal shot. Then he shot and killed 17-year-old Judy Davis, a student in Brenz's class. After that, he walked out of the classroom and fatally shot Jason Edward White. His third victim was supposed to be a female student, but a classmate pushed her out of the way and took the shotgun blast to his head. Houston then herded about 80 students into a classroom and held them hostage. For the next eight hours, he negotiated with the police, releasing the students at intervals. He would eventually surrender after the police handed him a signed document stating that he would only serve a five-year jail term. Now, at 51, he's currently on death row in San Quentin, California, awaiting the date of his execution. His horrific crimes remain etched in the minds of the community and the American people at large. Jason Anthony Hoffman Back in 2001, this school shooter named Jason Hoffman was found unresponsive in his cell while waiting for his sentence to be handed. Hoffman was 18 when he committed the deadly crime that sent shockwaves through the entire community. It all started on March 22, 2021 when the 18-year-old boy went on a bloody rampage at Granite Hills High School. Days before the shooting, Hoffman received the disappointing news that his application to the Navy had been rejected, and he got raving mad. He blamed his former vice principal for his rejection, so he devised a brutal revenge plan that eventually played out days later. Armed with a pump-action 12-gauge shotgun, Hoffman marched into the school and headed straight for the vice principal, and as soon as he found him, he opened fire. Luckily for the man, Hoffman missed, and so he turned to other people around, taking shots at three students and two teachers, before he was eventually shot in the jaw by an El Cajon police officer. Luckily, all the five people injured in the shooting recovered from their injuries, and it seemed his murderous rampage was botched. Hoffman also survived his injuries and made it to court, where he was subjected to a heavily publicized trial. But it was during the trial that officers began to notice a pattern of mental illness in the boy. Fearing that he may take his own life, Hoffman was transferred to a padded cell and spent several weeks there as the trials proceeded. However, after a while, a doctor cleared him to be returned to a regular cell, and that was when things took an unexpected turn. On that fateful day in October 30, 2001, Jason Anthony Hoffman was found dead in his cell, the young killer hanged himself by looping strips of bedsheet around the grillwork of an air vent, avoiding a sentence of 27 years to life. In his cell, officers found a one-page note full of doodles and profanity, but no reference to taking his own life or any remorse for the shooting. As Deputy District Attorney Dan Lamborn puts it, 
It was a sad ending to a very troubled young man. Now it's time for our subscribers pick. The disturbing tale of Nicolas Cruz and his deadly assault on Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School remains an unforgettable experience that still haunts America till today. As we explore what happens to school shooters in prison, it's safe to say people like these are treated quite differently than other inmates. Most school shooters who end up behind bars are separated from the rest of the population, which is a way to protect them from being jumped or killed. Apart from prison being a tough environment, school shooters also have a bad reputation when incarcerated, and they may become victims of targeted attacks by those on the inside who've heard the news. What do you think about the way these school shooters are treated in prison? Share your thoughts with us in the comments. Now let's get back to the video. Andrew Golden and Mitchell Johnson March 24, 1998 11-year-old Andrew Golden teamed up with his 13-year-old friend Mitchell Johnson to carry out the deadliest middle school shooting in the history of the United States. The night before, Golden and Johnson prepared for the horror they were about to unleash on the school, loading a Dodge Caravan that belongs to Johnson's mom with everything they'll need. Camping supplies, snacks, and nine different weapons, along with 2,000 rounds of ammunition, all of which were stolen from Golden's grandpa's house. The following morning, the two boys drove to Westside Middle School with their heavy artillery, arriving late so they would deliberately miss the bus. At about 12.30 p.m. during the beginning of the fifth period, Golden pulled the fire alarm, prompting the students to scramble for safety while Johnson took the weapons to the woods outside the school. Golden then ran back to meet up with his partner and recover his weapons. As soon as the children and teachers filed out of the school premises, the two boys suddenly appeared on scene and started shooting sporadically. At first, there was confusion among the students who thought it was all fake, but as the bloodshed escalated, they realized this was very, very real, and panic ensued. The two boys ended up claiming the lives of four students and one teacher, injuring nine other students and one teacher. Thankfully, all ten of those injured survived their injuries, one of whom was actually Golden's cousin, Tristan McGowan. After the shooting, Golden and Johnson tried escaping to their van, but they were subsequently caught by the police. During investigations, it was revealed that the boys had planned to run away afterwards, as they had everything ready from food to sleeping bags and even survival gear. Due to their age, the two were charged as juveniles, and after being found guilty of five counts of murder, they were sentenced to confinement until they reached the age of 21, when the maximum sentence would be handed down. However, the two boys found mercy and showed signs of rehabilitation during their time behind bars. So on August 11, 2005, Johnson was released from the Federal Correctional Institution in Memphis on his 21st birthday. Golden, on the other hand, was released on May 25, 2007, his 21st birthday as well. He spent just nine years behind bars. The lenient sentence attracted condemnation from the families of the victims, who believed that the perpetrators should have been prosecuted to the fullest extent since the shooting was premeditated. But even though Golden made it out of prison alive, he eventually lost his life in 2019 during a bloody car crash on Highway 167 near Cave City. Till his death and even beyond, the impact of his actions never faded, and he'll always be remembered as the 11-year-old kid who shot up a school, Charles Andrew Williams. At just 15 years old, Charles Andrew Williams committed a gruesome act that shocked his hometown of Santee, California a crime for which he's currently serving a 50-year prison term. But before the bloodshed stained the school grounds, there were lots of ignored red flags, which would have been detected if proper attention had been given. Weeks before he etched his name in the book of deadly school shooters, Williams complained to the school counselor that he was getting bullied, but nothing was done to curtail it. He also mentioned to the security guard that he was going to bring a gun to school, but again, no one took him seriously. As the semester unfolded, friends came to believe that Williams reached the peak and kept talking about how he didn't want to live anymore. All of this was because of his small size, which attracted lots of bullying even from those within his circle. So, after enduring the unbridled bullying for way too long, he decided to do something about it. On March 5, 2001, 
The 15-year-old boy entered a boy's bathroom at Santana High School with a loaded 22 caliber revolver he took from his father. His first victim was a freshman who was in the bathroom at the same time. He then went outside and started shooting sporadically as the situation got even more chaotic. By the time the murderous rampage was over, two people had been killed and 13 were left injured. The shooting was also heavily publicized and the then President George W. Bush delivered a statement calling the attack a disgraceful act of cowardice. After a very emotional trial, Williams was sentenced to 50 years in prison with the possibility of parole. His time in prison has been quite unremarkable, and his actions had faded into past memories until 2023, when news broke that the convicted felon may be up for parole in March 2024, after spending nearly 23 years in prison. For a person responsible for the deadliest school shooting in San Diego, it didn't come as a surprise that many didn't want him out of prison, this has led to renewed discussions about whether juvenile violent offenders deserve a second chance at life, and if they indeed can be rehabilitated. However, till today, the young offender is still incarcerated, and there is little hope that he'll be released anytime soon. Ethan Crumbly In the days leading to the Oxford High School shooting of 2021, rumors began to spread about an impending threat of mass shooting. While some took those rumors seriously and stayed home on that day, others thought it would never happen. But as everyone would later find out, these were no empty threats. The young student behind this deadly shooting was 15-year-old Ethan Crumbly, who was noticeably mentally disturbed prior to the incident. According to those who knew him personally, Crumbly's parents were pretty negligent, and they often left the boy at home while they frequented bars and clubs. His mental state would become further deteriorated in October 2021, when his only friend moved away and the family dog died. This sent the boy spiraling into depression, but no one really got him the help he needed. As early as March 2021, Crumbly started sending disturbing texts to his mom about his state of mind, talking about demons and ghosts living inside the home and talking to him in his head. He also reportedly recorded himself torturing animals, making Molotov cocktails, and in addition, he even drew a sketch of himself committing a school shooting. All the signs were there, as the young boy even joked about the shooting with a friend. Fast forward to the day of the incident, and Crumbly came to school armed with a 9mm semi-automatic handgun with at least two 15-round magazines. Surveillance footage showed him entering a bathroom and then exiting about a minute later, holding a semi-automatic handgun. Shortly after this, Crumbly began firing in the hallway during passing time, while hundreds of students moved from one class to another. As soon as the students started fleeing, Crumbly walked down the hallway, shooting into classrooms and at students who were unlucky enough to still be outside. But luckily, he was unable to access any of the classrooms. About 100 911 calls were made from that school, and within just two to three minutes after the police arrived, Crumbly was arrested unharmed by the school resource officer and a second deputy responding to the scene. Unfortunately, by then, four people had lost their lives, and seven were seriously injured. Subsequently, Crumbly was arraigned by a magistrate on charges of homicide and attempted homicide, but everything changed in December 1st, 2021, when his charges were upgraded to terrorism causing death, first-degree murder, assault with intent to murder, and possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony. He was also charged as an adult, so he could receive the full punishment for his crimes. And in October 2022, Crumbly pleaded guilty to all the charges against him. The case came to a close on December 9, 2023, when he was slammed with life in prison without the possibility of parole. However, what makes this particular case unique is that for the first time in U.S. history, a shooter's parents were also convicted for their child's crime. Jennifer and James Crumbly found themselves in court for their role in enabling their son's behavior, as well as granting him unfettered access to firearms. After being found guilty by the court for involuntary manslaughter, James and Jennifer are set to be sentenced on March 9, 2024, and they may likely face up to 15 years in prison. Jake and McLaughlin at around 11.35 a.m. on September 24, 2003, 
Freshman Jason McLaughlin walked out of the boys' locker room at Rokori High School in Cold Spring, Minnesota, armed with a Colt 22 caliber handgun. Just moments before the students were dismissed to their next class by the midday bell, McLaughlin opened fire, shooting two students at close range and ending their lives in an instant. Apparently, the two who lost their lives had bullied McLaughlin endlessly for his appearance, and even though he reported them many times, his appeal fell on deaf ears. So he decided to take matters in her own hands and serve the capital punishment. After shooting Aaron Rollins and Seth Bartell in the neck and chest respectively, McLaughlin was approached by a coach named Mark Johnson, who put his hands up and yelled at the young boy to stop. Luckily, he listened, unloaded his weapon, and dropped it to the ground. He was the forcibly taken to a nearby office before officers came around to take him away. Although only two people died during the shooting, many other students suffered from the trauma of witnessing such a terrifying event. As for McLaughlin, he was charged with two counts of first-degree murder, tried as an adult, and sentenced to life without parole. All attempts to claim mental health issues during trial were unsuccessful, and he was forced to pay for his crimes. According to the Minnesota Department of Corrections, McLaughlin is currently holed up at Minnesota's Oak Park Heights Correctional Facility. Not much is known about his life behind bars. But if the other stories are anything to go by, he's probably in protective custody, where he will remain until he's eventually transferred to the general population, where he will spend the rest of his life. John Romano. On a cold Monday morning in February 2024, John Romano hid in a bathroom stall on the third floor of the Columbia High School in East Greenbush. While there, he sent a text to his friends informing them that he was in school with a shotgun, while warning them to get out. The initial plan was to take the lives of at least 50 people on that day, but by the time the carnage was over, one teacher was wounded, and the students were left to deal with the trauma of such a shocking incident. He was soon arrested, charged, and handed a sentence of 17 to 20 years. But in an unexpected twist of fate, he was released in 2020, after serving just 15 years out of his sentence. But even though his prison experience was quite unremarkable, he would eventually face bitter but unrelated consequences once he got out. Like on August 29, 2022 when he was attacked while working at a homeless shelter. As the story goes, Romano was attending to a homeless man when things suddenly took a terrifying turn and the man attacked him with a sword. His injuries were very severe and he had to undergo urgent surgery to reattach some limbs. Luckily for him, he made it out alive. Since then, Romano has been trying to seek mercy from the general public for his crimes, but it seems unlikely that he'll ever be forgiven or accepted back into society. Thank you for watching this video. See you in the next one.